Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Well, I know that the post-lunch session is always the hardest one, so we promise you some drama and some controversy here on that panel. Before we talk about the future of the Middle East, let me take you back in history to the year 1916. It was on May 16, that same year, when a French diplomat and his British colleague, Matt Fratty, had a nice little chat and then signed what later on came to be known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Those two gentlemen, in fact, carved out the post-Ottoman order in the Middle East, an order which has lasted for almost a century. But as we all know, today, those lines in the sand that Monsieur Picot and Mr. Sykes had drawn are getting more and more blurred, states are collapsing in the region, and a new kind of creature has emerged, a jihadist proto-state called ISIL, which is cutting across the borders of Syria and Iraq. In sum, I think it is fair to say that the Middle East as we know it is gone, and unlike in 1916, the great-grandchildren of Sykes and Picot have neither the appetite nor the ability to impose a new regional order on the Middle East. And then what about the regional actors, you may ask? Well, it seems to me that for the time being, they're just too divided to come up with a common vision for their region. Now, what we are going to do in the coming hour or so is certainly not trying to come up with a grand design for the future of the Middle East. We'll be, ma we'll be way more modest. We will try to look into some of the crises of the region, Syria, of course, ISIL, the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, and then we will try and see what possible scenarios or po even possible solutions to these conflicts could be. Thomas just introduced um, the great panel that is with me here on the stage. And without much further ado, let us start with, with Syria. I think that is very fair because Syria is really at the heart of this breakup of the regional order in the Middle East. And I think it is also no exaggeration to say that neither the international community nor the regional actors have done a very good job when it comes to managing this crisis. Now, Phil, I would like to start with you. A former colleague of yours, actually, Fred Hoff, said recently in an interview that trying to hold the war in Syria at arm's length becomes the operational equivalent of pouring gasoline on a fire. Now, my question to you is, was it really U.S. inaction on Syria that has exacerbated the situation in Syria and on Syria? And since you're no longer in government, um, what should the U.S. do better? Uh, thanks, Noren. It's nice to be here. I look forward to this <coughs> challenging panel. I uh, would reinforce the, the premise that you started with about the breakdown of Sykes-Picot, and you see that more in Syria than elsewhere, but it's not just Syria. Uh, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, this state structure that we have come to know is really disappearing before our eyes, and I think the reality is we need, to, uh, we need to accept that it is more likely that this disintegration continues than that we're going to put this map that we used to be familiar with. Look, on the question of Syria, uh, it is impossible to do anything other than accept and admit that the status quo is horrible for the Syrian people, for their neighbors, the, on the humanitarian level, in terms of uh, instability spilling over into the neighboring states. And now what we've seen is that instability further spilling over under the shores of Europe, which uh, makes clear to everybody that containment is not an option. I, I agree with that, uh, with that premise. I think to a certain degree, uh, not just the United States, but all powers who didn't want to get pulled into a conflict in Syria, hope to be able to mitigate and contain the problem, and it's increasingly clear that that's not, uh, not the case. The problem with attributing that to U.S. policy, and I'm sure this will be a part of our vigorous debate, the problem with attributing that to U.S. policy is that it assumes that there was some other course of action that would have spared us all of this mess, and that when you criticize efforts to contain and mitigate, 
you're implying that if only the United States had done X or Y in 2011, we wouldn't have this crisis, the neighbors wouldn't be destabilized, and Europe wouldn't have migrants. I wish I knew what that thing was, and I wish I knew what that thing is today. I can tell you what I think we need to do uh, uh, at this point, but, uh, but to, to underscore this questioning of the road not traveled, which always looks better, I still have not heard a persuasive argument uh, of what the United States or others could have done that would have somehow made this problem uh, go away. So we could have armed the opposition earlier. Would that have led to the regime and its backers in Russia and Iran to accept the political transition that we want and lead to a stable Syria? Or would, have it, would it have invited us to then do the next step uh, to get rid of that regime and bring about that transition? I remind that we have been supporting the uh, opposition with a view to empowering it militarily to the point that it forces this transition or forces the regime out. And the consequence of that has not been political transition to something more stable, but a doubling down and a counter escalation by Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah leading to what we see today. I could give many more examples, and again, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but the point is, uh, there have not been credible alternative paths to deal with the situation in Syria, which I think needs to lead us to the conclusion about what we do now, which in my view is acknowledge that what we have been doing for the past several years is not working and not likely to work. And again, I would describe that as increasing support to the opposition, military and political, with the view to strengthening it to the point that the regime and its backers will accept a political transition that evolves Assad's immediate departure, leading to something more stable. It seems to me that just doubling down on that path will double down on the outcome that we've been seeing, which is why we need to consider other, even unpalatable approaches, like uh, getting everybody around the same table, including the backers of the regime and the backers of the opposition, and accepting a messy, compromise-like situation that might not include a political transition in the first instance, but would at least start with a ceasefire that would be a major uh, step forward compared to where we are today. I mean, I know we're supposed to talk about the future of the Middle East on that panel, but still, let me ask you, do you agree with Phil that basically the US had no alternative to the path it chose on Syria? Well, y yes and no, to be honest. I mean, uh, I think going back to the Syrian crisis, the way it, it has evolved is an embodiment of not just U.S., but regional and international failure in terms of dealing with that crisis. Let's remember that when the Syrian crisis first started, it was in the midst of the Arab Spring. Everybody just jumped to the bandwagons of saying, yeah, we've got democracy coming to the region. So we've seen what the U.S. and Europe did in Libya. They went, bombed Libya, got rid of Gaddafi, and then left the country to become a, a wasteland for every terrorist and every mess to happen. Uh, in the course of Syria, again, uh, when, we, when the crisis started, the assumption was we're going to get rid of Assad in three months. And you could hear these statements coming from Washington, coming from Europe, coming even from the region. The Assad is not going to last. And those statements really ignored the fact that this is a regime that's very entrenched, that, that has a lot of power, uh, that will go the whole nine yards and destroying everything in order for it to stay in power, and that had very, very strong backing from Iran, which is, again was willing to go the whole way to preserve that regime in order for it to preserve its interest in, in the area, particularly when it comes to uh, Hezbollah. Uh, and you had Russia in the background, which was providing the regime with all the political support that it needed. So we came in and we looked at a people who were suffering under a dictator. Assad had no problem you know, bombing, killing, destroying, even gassing some of his own people. The international community was just looking at it from a, from a distance. We went to arming the opposition, and we went about it the wrong way as well. Uh, the U.S. started a program of arming the opposition, but that, that program was a total failure. And they armed people to start a war, but nobody went the extra length of arming them to win that war. So actually arming the opposition in such insufficient way outside a broader strategy or a broader policy objective, what we did is that we gave asset grants to proceed with his rhetoric that I'm, that I'm fighting against uh, an organized militia that is a terrorist militia that's radicalized and, that, and that's that. As far as Europe is concerned, I think Europe woke up to the crisis only when refugees started knocking on its door. 
uh, for three, four years, people in the region were, were telling everybody, like, this is a major crisis. And if you allow Syria to, 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 to spiral out of control, nobody's going to be immune. And I think uh, 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 that has proven to be true. Refugees, Europe is just grappling with probably a million refugees in Jordan alone. We had 1.5 million refugees, which is more than of all Europe combined. And we are a nation of 7 million people. Uh, and and we've, been, we've been dealing with that for years. And, and what are we, you know, do the Europe only now realize that we have a, a refugee problem and we should do something about it. Uh, politically now, again, where is the solution? I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody has an answer to that solution. Uh, you, the, the Syria crisis is no longer a war, uh, a civil war between people yearning for freedom and for their rights to live in dignity and a regime that is that is bloody and that is willing to kill everybody in order to stay in power. Syria now is basically uh, 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 merely the, 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 the ground battle for wars. Russia is fighting the U.S. The U.S. is fighting Russia. Saudi Arabia is fighting Iran. Iran is fighting uh, Qatar. Uh, and everybody is fighting everybody in Russia. And the only victims is Syria and the Syrian people. So we're talking about a whole nation that is disintegrated. Now, the consequences of that, even when we tried to do something, ISIS came up. And again, we've got, you started your, your argument with, 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 you know, with a hysterical perspective. Let's go back to why ISIS started. The people who are fighting within the ranks of ISIS now are those who grew up under the despair and the hopelessness of Saddam Hussein and the post-Saddam Hussein period. And back to American politics, America led the war in Iraq, went there, it had no scenario for the day after. And, and even that, in 2003, we were at a good point. Uh, Qaeda has been defeated uh, uh, and everything is lost. But no leverage was exercised on the government that, that came into power then, which is the government of Malki, to influence any positive policy decision. So Malki was, was, was allowed to proceed with sectarian politics that antagonized the Sunni population. He became more of an agent of Iranian foreign policy than a leader of Iraq. And we have the mess that we are now. So basically, to sum up, I think the problem with Syria is that Everybody is acting out of a strategy. The Russians do not have a strategy in Syria. The Russians came to Syria to protect their own interests in Syria, which is basically they want to present, uh, prevent a regime change so that because they don't want a precedent. Uh, the Americans do not have a strategy in Syria. They're looking at it in terms of tactical way. What do we do to stop it from growing here or there? The Arab world doesn't have a strategy in Syria. Again, we're supporting groups. Some of us supporting groups that the U.S. consider terrorists, uh, that probably we in Jordan consider terrorists, that Europe considers terrorists but somebody else considers an ally. Uh, so how are you going to solve Syria? I think you need a grand deal that would look and recognize the interconnectedness of all the problems in the region. You've got to look at Yemen, you've got to look at Libya, you've got to look at Syria, you've got to look at Saudi, Arab, Iranian rivalry, you've got to look at Russian, American rivalry. But the bottom line is, and, and this is it, is that we all know Assad cannot rule, Assad cannot stay in power. And even Russia now, which is in the world, need to realize that any outcome has to end with, with Assad out of, out of the crisis. Yes, it needs to be a tidy transition because a vacuum would mean, would mean a chaos through which ISIS and other radical group would come into play. We'll come to ISIL later on. We'll also come to the, um, what you suggested, Congress of Vienna type solution where everybody in the region gets together and, and gets to solve the, the crisis. But um, you said something interesting. Nobody actually has a strategy on Syria. Nobody, maybe, except for our friends in, in Tehran, Sadiq um, let me Let me ask you this. It seems to me that over the past weeks and maybe months, um, there is this increasing subcutaneous, very subtle um, activity of Iran in Syria. I mean, we've all read the reports about an increasing number of troops, of, Syrian, uh, of, of Iranian troops in Syria, about those IRGC guys, I think four commanders or so that got killed in one week, and then also <laughs> photos of General Soleimani apparently taken in Syria. So my question to you is, first of all, are we going to see more of this in Syria, more of this Iranian activity? And secondly, this question goes a little bit further. Would you say that those people are justified in hindsight who said, well, maybe after the nuclear deal, Tehran's regional policy is going to be ever more assertive and ever more, well, let's put it that way, ever more robust. Would you, would you subscribe to that? Okay, thank you very much, 
appreciate it for inviting me to participating at this forum. I am coming from Tehran and region. I think that would be very interesting for our audiences today. I would like to tell you the second question, uh, to focus on the second question, and then back to the first question. Iran would like to have a very active and positive uh, policy in Middle East. We are so concerned about our situation. Really, our situation is a land of crisis, land of disaster, the land of uh, human, unhuman being situations. Very sadness. You are in Europe and looking just for actually some immigration or some refugees. But we are in the region and we are concerned about the different aspects of the crisis, economic, political, genocide, and so many other things in the region. Unfortunately, the double standard policy toward a region from the superpower, American and European, make a disaster for the region. Look there, as my dear brother, <coughs> Ayman, emphasized about the Arab season. The Arab season demolished by double standard strategy and policy by some European and American. This is the, actually, performances of this policy. Look the situation of Libya, look the situation of Yemen, look the situation of some other Arab countries. We are in Syria. We wanted to establish a, a stability and continuity of the Syrian <coughs> integrity. That would be most important for us, for Iran, the Syrian integrated would be uh, actually by the political solutions, not war. If somebody says in Syria we have a civil war, I believe 100% is wrong. The big mistake of analysis. We do not have any civil war in Syria. We have a war between the terrorism and government. Look, we have an exhibition of terrorism in Syria. ICC, Boko Haram, Jebhat al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, some others. The exhibitions of terrorism gathered in this country and supported by some intelligences inside and outside of the region. There is enough information who is behind of ICC, who is behind of Jebhat al-Nusra. There is no any civil war. The Syrian thousand years, the Sunnis and Shias live, to, live very good with each other. They have a good family relationship. But the problem is from outside. So who is that outside force that you're talking about? Actually, there is uh, some uh, ambitions to control of the region <coughs> too far from the region, American and some European. Look, I would like to tell you, after the assassination, my very dear friend, late Hariri, Unfortunately, the policy of the French based of the family relationship between President Chirac and family of Hariri arranged. And the French immediately missed Syria and the situation of the region 
has too many crises. American double standard policy to the region we have. We have the situation of Pentagon, Defense Intelligence Service, CIA, American formal policy towards Syria. There is no any constructive plan to make a solution in Syrian crisis and if I, if I may come in at this point, you said there is no constructive plan to, to work towards a solution in Syria. So what about the, the Vienna talks? The first round took place, the second round is going to take place over the weekend. So that is a first attempt where Saudi and Iran and some other stakeholders sit together. Would you say that this is some sort of a constructive approach? Laura, can I Actually, throw in a at the moment. At the moment, let him answer and then you get your question. We believe the only way is a constructive approach to the Syrian crisis. Vienna is a good step, it's a very positive step and gesture to the crisis. We support it. We are, as the Iranian, wanted to participate in for any plan to make a solution. We don't want to have any problem in the region. We don't want to have any war in the region. Why the Saudis attack in Yemen with the rental army? There is no any air forces. Everybody knows that the Saudis fighting in Yemen with the rental air forces and rental army and disaster for the situation of Yemeni's people. How look the situation of the Libya? And the Syria is the same. <clears throat> we can actually, a step by step, constructive gesture to the problem of the Syrian first. Iran are ready to full cooperate to make a solution, but not with a precondition. There is a precondition, the Bashar Assad gone. No, Bashar Assad, that's a part of game. Bashar Assad is a president, is a, has a government, is not a revival. The front of the Bashar Assad is a, two important things. One, a revival, all revival is a terrorist. Everybody in the international community emphasized all of them is a terrorist group. Another one is opposition. <coughs> we accept the oppositions. We accept the oppositions. Opposition has a right to have a running, to have a actually negotiating, to make a solution. We're supporting them, not without any uh, other plans to demolishing a real government and former government in Syria. Thank you so much. You mentioned France a couple of times, so I'm glad we have a former French diplomat here with us on the panel. But before I turn it over to you, yeah, I'm a new... I'll, no, I'll come back. Okay. But I'd like to, to respond. But All right, so you, you, um, I, w I would like to bring you into the, into the conversation, um, Jean-Marie Guéhenot. Um, Dr. Harazi said something very critical about the European role when it comes to um, Syria, but um, would you subscribe to the argument that Iran is a force for good in Syria? Well, I think Iran has been a strong ally of uh, President Assad with uh, military forces uh, in, uh, in Syria, uh, and which have played an increasingly important role as the forces of Assad have been uh, weakened. Uh, I think we should have brought Iran in the discussion much earlier. I think it was a mistake of uh, Western powers uh, not to include Iran in the discussion. There was a fear that that would weaken the negotiating position on the nuclear negotiation. I, I think it could have been handled without uh, weakening uh, that, uh, the, the, the position on that negotiation. That being said, at the moment, frankly, I'm not sure at all that Iran is a positive force in the, uh, in the um, uh, Syria crisis. Because at the moment, what do we see? Is that both sides believe that they can win. And certainly, uh, the uh, Syrian government believes it can win. 
in particular because it has that strong support. So it doesn't have much of an interest in the negotiation. And the uh, various oppositions believe that uh, through uh, uh, external support from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, the United States, they may also win. So in my view, there is a kind of stalemate, but there is not a perception uh, of a stalemate. Uh, and so long as there is not a de-escalation in the regional rivalry between Iran on one side, uh, Saudi, the Gulf countries and Turkey on the other, it's very difficult to see how they're going to be uh, progress. Uh, and I think personally that the, de the, the de-escalation between Iran and the Gulf countries will be very difficult to engineer because there is a sense of imbalance. On paper, that imbalance would seem to favor Saudi Arabia, which is one of the biggest military budgets of the world. But in the uh, minds of people, actually, uh, Iran uh, sees itself as potentially a dominant power in the region, and the Gulf countries have that perception. And so... And the Persian Gulf. Oh, yes. important and, distinction. And so <laughs> it's very yeah. difficult to I have. I promise a, you some drama. So here okay. you have a constructive it. relationship when there is that sense of imbalance, superiority, inferiority. I think the uh, the one country that could contribute to the overall balance of the region is Turkey, and I think there the Europeans uh, have made a lot of mistakes, and not just uh, since the. Uh, uh, Syrian crisis, but in uh, years uh, before, uh, in not reaching out to Turkey, giving, giving it uh, uh, a privileged relationship uh, with the European Union, uh, so that Turkey could have taken a slightly different course that President Erdogan at some point was willing to take, and gradually he's moved away from that. Turkey has the, the military capacity, the, the, the strength, to be a real balancer. And obviously, with a long border with uh, Syria, it could play an important uh, role, and it could play a constructive uh, role. And I think Turkey needs to be engaged on that now. <coughs> it's going to be engaged because of the refugee <coughs> crisis, but it should be in a much broader framework than that. Very briefly, on Vienna, what's your sense? I mean, listening to you, 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 you are not overly optimistic that something constructive will come out of those talks. No, I think it's a good, it's a good thing that uh, now uh, the Iranians, the Saudis, uh, the various countries in the, of the Gulf are in the same room. I think that's, uh, that's progress. I don't expect any quick uh, progress. I don't think, considering the respective posi position of uh, various parties, it's possible. And, and frankly, I think, and it was interesting uh, listening to our Iranian colleague, because the, the reading of the crisis is so fundamentally different. Uh, uh, we don't read it as just Assad fighting terrorists. And honestly, when one looks at the history of the crisis, terrorism came late in the, in, 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 in the crisis. It started with peaceful demonstrations that were very harshly uh, repressed in their art. Uh, and then gradually it militarized. It militarized not with radical Islamists, it radicalized first with the Free Syrian Army, with uh, Sunni officers for the Syrian Army who had defected uh, and uh, who, who were not radical Islamists at all. And, and then, then the, the radical Islamists uh, gradually ca came in. So I think just describing the crisis of a fight of one uh, of a government against terrorism is not a good basis uh, to move forward. Mm. Ayman, no. let me bring you on, um, into the conversation on the issue of radicalization and, and possibly also ISIL. Um, there are those who say that Assad and ISIL are practically two faces of the same coin in the sense that Syria Sunnis <coughs> get driven into the arms of ISIL by those, you know, barrel bombs that are being thrown um, on the people by the Assad regime. Is that a reading of the situation that you would yeah. subscribe to? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think Joe Marie touched on the point that I wanted to address. It, it is outrageous to, 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 to suggest that the Syrian crisis is one between a choice between Assad and, and, and radical and terrorist forces. Again, go back to the, to the beginning of the crisis. There were tens of thousands of Syrian people demonstrating openly, peacefully in the street, and they were not even demanding the downfall of the regime. They were just demanding that the regime reforms itself with a view to rendering life more tolerable 
under the Ba'at uh, uh, leadership and under the Assad uh, leadership. Number two, to, to say that Iran is concerned with the integrity of Syria is again a distortion of the fact. Iran is in Syria to protect its own interests. Uh, it, it has supported the regime. It continues to support the regime, and not just in Syria. I mean, I think we've got to look at the broader picture because everything in the region is so interconnected. I think you need to look at what is it that Iran wants from its regional policies. And let's look at the crises that are, that are happening in the region now. You've got Syria. Iran is supporting Assad, arming Assad, sending troops to, to fight Syrian people. Hezbollah, which is a proxy of Iran, uh, a military tool of Iran, is also contributing to the killing of the Syrian people. Outside any agenda or any political objective other than sustaining a regime that its own people do not want and that has ruled with blood for, for decades. You look, go back to the Arab Gulf, and, and again, you call it Persian, I call it Arab. Go back to the Arab Gulf, look, at, look before that at the border in Iraq. We're having a prime minister now, Abadi, who is trying to reform. Now he's being challenged by Malki. Where, where is Malki getting his support? He's getting it from Iran. So after 10 years in power, during which Malki allowed for ISIS to re-emerge as a result of his exclusivist sectarian politics, you have another prime minister from the same party that produced Malki, who's trying to address reality by, by applying a more kind of moderate policy, and he's being challenged by Malki, who is being supported by Iran. Go to Yemen and to the Houthi war, and every indication is that uh, 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 Iran, Tehran, is supporting the Houthis, arming the Houthis with a view to exercising power uh, in the Arab Gulf as well through, through, uh, through Yemen. So all these are, are factors that we need to look at and see why is Iran doing that, what is its policy objective other than serving its own sort of expansionist policies to the region. Back to your question, absolutely right. I mean, ultimately, people went back to ISIS, went back to radical ideology because they lost hope. And Syrian people, initially, there was no room for ISIS. People were going out, Christians, Shi Alawi, Shi Sunni, Durzi, whatever, they were all out saying we want a better life. Now they were pushed into it when you killed hope. So as long as Assad is in power, when Russia comes in and supports Assad, when Iran is there and supporting Assad, basically it's giving people no choice and it's empowering radical groups like ISIS, particularly that moderate groups are not being supported enough politically, financially, or even militarily. So we are, we, you know, that is the argument that Assad regime is saying, and unfortunately that argument is echoing within, with, with its supporters, and unfortunately even some uh, outside observers who are looking at, at the crisis now from a very superficial view are saying, well, if we have, don't have Assad, we have ISIS. Yes, if we don't have Assad, without a process that guarantees a transition, a tidy transition that everybody around the table gets to work around, then we might, uh, we, 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 we might have to get ISIS. And again, go back to ISIS in Iraq, Qaeda in Iraq. Why did it start? Because people lost hope. After the, 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 the disintegration of Saddam regime, Maliki came power, followed exclusionist policies, antagonized people, they lost hope. They organize under ISIS. So, and that is what we're seeing in Syria right now. On that, on that one, just a, a quick point. Let's not forget that the Islamic State is born of several mistakes or policy, I mean, wrong directions. One was in the debasification, uh, all the uh, officers of the Saddam Hussein army out of a job, and we, and we know that a number of them uh, provided the military expertise to the Islamic State now. And then the role of Shia militias uh, under, uh, under, under Maliki. And so the sense of victimization by Sunni. So it's a, uh, we don't, let's not forget that Islamic State was born in Iraq and the product of those mistakes. And now it's a pro it extends to Syria because of the despair of uh, a number of people who feel uh, that the uh, more mainstream uh, groups uh, are not achieving what they want to achieve. When I was uh, working on Syria with Kofi Annan, I remember meeting with uh, officers of the Free Syrian Army in a meeting with the opposition, and, one of, and I was telling them that they should not expect a, a kind of Libya-type scenario, which they were all dreaming of. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was telling them that's not going to happen. You have illusions on what uh, NATO uh, will do. It will not happen. And one of them told me, oh, if you're right, then someday I will put on a suicide bomb. A bit of flourish in that, but it, it tells the story of how people have moved from being mainstream to being radicalized. Phil, I would like to address a question to you that I posed to you earlier on, um, Dr. Harazi, and that is the question about the 
Middle East post-nuclear deal in a way. Um, there was this hope at some point that, you know, this nuclear deal would open up a new momentum for conflict resolution on Syria, maybe also on Yemen. And what we see now in the region, there is nothing new under the sun, meaning that the challenges have remained the same, the problems have remained the same. So would you say um, that this is a correct analysis and was this hope that things would change with the deal, was it unrealistic from the very beginning or would you rather say that before things get better in the region they have to get much worse? Uh, a couple of things. Let me make two brief comments about what's been said and then I'll mm -hmm. get to this important question about Iran. One, Jean-Marie's point about Iraq is relevant in the sense of Let's remember when you do certain things in the Middle East, it has consequences and not always the ones you intended. And I, I raise that in the context of Syria because when you focus on one objective, which is a quite valid objective, let's get rid of Assad, you need to think of all the uh, downstream effects of that. Just like in Iraq, we had a real problem. No one should deny that Saddam Hussein's regime was a real problem. And we went the route of no-fly zone sanctions and then we fixed that problem but led to a lot of others, including a very big one in the, in the sense of, of ISIS. So keep that in mind throughout this entire conversation. When you're fixing one problem, beware of the ones that you're going to create. That's relevant for Syria. On the Vienna talks, I agree that it is a step forward and have long thought that everyone needed to be at the table because you can't solve this without Russia and Iran, Saudi, Qatar, Turkey, and so on. But the discussion also reveals how it is only a first step and a small step because so far at Vienna, the sides are still deeply divided, mainly the Saudis and the Iranians. And it's even worse than Joe Murray said in one sense. If it were just that each side thinks it can win, then maybe when you got to the point where they realized they couldn't win, it would change. But I actually think it's to the point that even if they know they can't win, they are determined to carry on uh, in the same direction. I think that when you hear that from the Saudis, when you say, uh, do you think that this is going to lead to you know, regime change and transition to what you want? And aren't you worried that if it doesn't, it's more radicalization, refugees, and war? And the answer it comes close to being a form of, so be it. We are going to fight the Iranians because Iran is on the march in the region, and we have to stand up to them. So it's not just a question of can we achieve our objectives, but there seems to be this determination to pursue maximalist uh, ends. And my view is, and that's why I think there's a role, you know, it's important to have everyone at the table, but there's a U.S. leadership role and, and with welcome European support to explore whether there isn't something possible short of maximalism. Because if we each stick with that on maximum on the same side, we are going to have years and years. And that's why I've come to the view that where I was, I, whereas I would love to do what's necessary, supporting the opposition, using force to get, uh, to bring about that regime change, peaceful transition that has been our objective, uh, because I don't think that's likely on the course we're on, I think we need to be open to alternative courses. And I'll just put out shorthand, and I see, you know, Carl Bildt is here and a lot of people who worked on Bosnia back in the day. It was necessary then, too, to realize we weren't going to accomplish all of our goals and bring everyone to the table for a messy, diplomatic, and ugly solution, that is a hell of a lot better than where we happen to be headed. Uh, apologize for that uh, discursion. The answer to your question, Nora, on Iran is, first of all, I mean, there are several uh, elements to it. One is, speaking, the United States, at least, did this deal because it needed to solve the Iranian nuclear question. Uh, Iran was on track to be very close to a nuclear weapons capability, and we couldn't think of a better way to deal with that really important problem. So all of the talk about transforming the relationship and Iranian policy in the region, that's nice and important, but let's not lose sight of the fact that this was a nuclear deal designed to deal with the nuclear issue. And again, nobody has presented to us at least, or that was the administration's view, and I think the Europeans as well, a better way to deal with that. That said, it is also true that we sometimes thought about or discussed the notion that over time this could lead to a different relationship with Iran. That wasn't the purpose of the deal, it wasn't the assumption of the deal, it wasn't guaranteed by the deal, but it's an open question whether, you know, this blocks Iran's path to a nuclear weapon for, you know, whatever, their different stages, but to, you know, 10, 15 years at least given the constraints. I think it's at least fair to imagine whether during that time 
Iran could change. It will certainly have a leadership change at the top. Uh, maybe a more open Iranian economy will have transformative effects within the country. Maybe demonstrating that it's actually possible to come to a table and compromise and do a deal in the mutual interests will lead some people in both countries to see it's possible. So all of that is possible down the road. But I, I get a little bit impatient with the pronouncements that we're already hearing, that the deal has failed. The deal only implementation day was, was less than a month ago. It was like two weeks ago. And now we're having pronouncements that, well, Iran still a problem in the region. I guess the Iran nuclear deal didn't work. That's a little bit premature. Uh, let's first understand that it was designed to stop the nuclear issue. And second, see where we are in 10 or 15 years. I don't think any of us imagined that it would transform the relationship with Iran uh, within a few weeks of being finalized. This is a perfect lead over to my final question for this part of the discussion before we go to the Q&A and before it's your turn. Um, Sadiq Harazi, let me reframe a question that I think Ayman, you posed earlier on. It, very, very briefly, how would you describe the ultimate rationale of Iranian regional policy? Actually, Thanks to my friend, uh, American uh, friend who talked about Iran nuclear uh, cases, uh, his mind about the Iranian nuclear cases, but the reality is differences and is not enough time and it's not a good time to talking about Iranian nuclear peaceful uh, process and it's better talking about this in other sessions or other forums but we are focused on uh, Iran and regional situation and Iran uh, transparent uh, policy uh, to the region look to the position of Minister Javad Zarif in Vienna. We are very transparent. We do not have any reservation to talking our policy. We do not have any problem to uh, actually make a reservation. We have a, a lot of opportunity. We have authority. We do not have any uh, stability problem and we do not have any continuity problem. Iran had have a very strong situation in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, if uh, John led me to tell you Persian Gulf is a Persian Gulf. <laughs> and I would like to tell you our policy is transparent. The terminologically, we do not have any problem to make a solution, not for Syria, just Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, Bahrain, Iraq, Afghanistan. And may, what, very briefly, if you, if you talk about we, you're, you're referring to Foreign Minister Zarif and, and, and his entourage. Or are you also talking about, you know, I will tell you, the other yes, actually, that would actors be more, yes, in that Iranian would, foreign policy? Yes, that would be most important. We are ready to participate in, for any plan to make a solution and to make an election in Syria. Mm -hmm. The only way <coughs> for make a solution in Syria is an election. And we must <coughs> actually have a... a respect for Syrian people and Syrian systems. We are not, we proud, we are a friend of Bashar Assad, but we are not a friend of Saddam Hussein. John said about Iran is a very close friend and ally and special uh, actually friend of Assad, yes, but we are not a friend of Saddam Hussein and we are not supporting Saddam to against nuclear war and chemical weapons. The reality in the, system, in reality in the uh, region and reality in the Persian Gulf and our neighbors is completely different as a 
somebody thinking in the West. We are ready to supporting any solutions and the only thing is a negotiation, talking, election, and civil approach to the situation of Syria. Ayman talked about Iran supporting Yemen. Yes, we supporting any people, not a Shiite. We supporting to the Sunnis in Bosnia. We supporting to the Palestinian people. We supporting to the Sunnis in Afghanistan. Who was behind the attack to the poor people of Yemen? Why you are talking, why you don't talk about the illegal aggression and illegal, uh, actually, occupation of Saudis in Yemen? Because the Saudis is to cover Sana'a first. Actually, no, actually this, is, this is a completely wrong. During the Saddam Hussein, your country was full supporting of Saddam Hussein. Some others full supporting of some, Iran was full cooperated with West for Saddam, for demolishing of Saddam Hussein, for demolishing of revival, Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Who was the behind of 9-11? The Saudis, Jordans, United Arab Emirates, Jordan all of them. Was the United Arab Emirates 9-11? Some of them. I'd like to hear that. Actually, because, because let, you can't let, just let say a statement say, without explaining no, let it. Me, let me talk. No, but my, explain that. How no, well no, no, let me tell you, my friend. Let behind of the 9-11, behind okay. of the terrorist attacks was Saudis, United Arab Emirates, the people from the Jordan and some others. Why you actually wanted to disappear for the reality? Because the reality is a reality. Maybe it seems to me that this is a conversation which should be have in, in need, more of a bilateral need, yeah. framework. I think this is the. <laughs> no, no, but one point. Fine, this you know, is the, the nature of the problem. Why, like, why do we have problems? Actually, they forget. Why do we have problems? Actually, they forget during the war between Iran and Iraq. They forget the 9-11. They forget to supporting a terrorism in the region. They forget the supporting of Al-Qaeda and Taliban and the ICC. They forget everything, just talking about Iran. Yes, Iran as a regional power wanted to a stability and continuity, not as a, you thinking about this. Let well, that's, Iran that's... has a transparent policy right. to establishment, uh, uh, actually, democracy. Which democracy running in the region? In Egypt, you have a democracy today? I think you have that's... a democracy in Libya? What happened? What is the performances of yeah, the Arab you citizens? The you're throwing what questions. What is the performances of the Arab citizens in the region? Right. You're, you're throwing questions to the audience. That's great because they're supposed to really answer the, your question and also ask questions of themselves. Oh, very briefly, very Ayman, and I'll, I'll, then I'll we'll go to the Q&A. I'll just answer very briefly. I mean, I, to his question, like, who's, Iran wants stability and it's supporting Assad killing his people in, in Syria. Iran wants stability and Iran is supporting Maliki destroying the whole political process in Iraq. Uh, Iran wants stability and Iran is exploiting the Arab-Israeli conflict, which, by the way, nobody mentioned here, just to throw slogans while the Palestinians pay the price. Iran wants stability and Iran arms Hezbollah to the death, not to go and fight Israel, but to go and take Beirut and occupy Beirut. Iran wants stability and Iran goes to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries in the Gulf. Iran wants stability and it arms the Houthis to the, to the, to the teeth. Look, I mean, we, we can talk till the cows come home, but ultimately what all the problems that we have with Iran are related to areas where Iran is acting not as a Westphalian state with pragmatist policy, but where Iran is transcending that role to assume leadership of the Shia communities in Arab countries, which is mean you're giving your right, this, the, yourself the right to violate all the rules of the international system and to go and interfere in internal affairs in a very aggressive way. And while you're just watching, the wars are happening in my backyard, in my, on, my, on, my, on my borders. So to you, this might be an intellectual argument where you just put some money towards Hezbollah to us, the war is happening in our, in our, in our, in our homes. So the Syrian people are destroyed, hundreds of thousands of people killed. Where, where is your positive role there? Where is your positive role in Iraq? So that, that, let's just put things in perspective. I, I, I have to stop you. I'm sorry, Ayman, because um, we really have to leave some time for the question and answer part of this discussion. Um, you know the rules here at Karba Foundation, and I would add one rule to that. Please, no political posturing and no blame game. So... Um, <laughs>
<laughs> Actually, <laughs> so Ambassador Chengizer is first. Thank you. I'm the Director General <coughs> for Policy Planning in Turkey. Don't worry, I won't be going into your Arabian Persian Gulf thing, but <coughs> I would rather uh, make a point and ask the question to Mr. Jean Mergeno. Uh, this uh, refugee crisis, whatever, it was a slow motion disaster. It did not happen about three months ago. It was there and it was already a European crisis. It started in Turkey in 2011. Nobody was talking about the costs of human costs, of course, of this disaster. We had been receiving in excess of two million refugees. We have not been receiving any help. And the main cause is that Europe still lacks a strategic debate on Turkey. The great European debate in the tradition of great European debates, the pros and cons. When it is the case of Turkey, this has not been done for years. You never had, as Europeans, this debate on Turkey, more than two hours, three hours. You need to have, I would say we need to have, a structured debate in the tradition of Grand Depa European. Let's talk about the pros and cons with a long view. Since Europe lacked very much the strategic thinking over Turkey, this slow motion disaster uh, came to the, I mean, at the center of Europe. So the question is, the, I, I think I have two questions. Can we make it one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm suddenly, I'm, I should be quick. Okay, well, how to evade, how to evade in Vienna then? the uh, mistakes of Iraq, that is debatification. We don't think we need a complete overhaul of the Syrian regime. How do we uh, play with that? I mean, how, what, what are the techniques uh, not to repeat the mistakes of Iraq in 2000, which is really the Pandora's box from our point of view? Thank you. Thank you so much. The question was addressed to you. Well, I was uh, at the meeting of Geneva 1, and the, the formula that was agreed, the only thing that was ever agreed, uh, was a transitional governing body. And, and the words were carefully chosen uh, so that it would not identify a government versus a presidency. It would be sufficiently fuzzy to provide for evolution. And I, I think in the, in the public discussion afterward, there has been much too much focus on uh, the presidency and on the president. Uh, and that it's clear that there will not be peace, stable peace in Syria uh, with President Assad, but there cannot be a process that legislate that President Assad has to be uh, out. And so we have to get around uh, that issue. And I think that's been the one weakness of the position of Western countries in their discussions with Russia in particular uh, on that issue is that there's never been a, a very credible pass on how you move to um, the starting position, Assad is there, to the end position, Assad uh, is gone. Uh, I think what we need to discuss, what should be discussed in, uh, in Vienna, is a formula that dilutes uh, power at the top uh, for a transitional uh, period, leading to I mean, uh, accompanied by ceasefire. And then there are, I think, the, uh, some elements in the Iranian plan, the idea of uh, elections, that indeed will be part of the solution. And probably a combination for a transition of uh, a power that is diluted between the presidency and the government, ceasefires, a schedule for election, and a process of decentralization and international security guarantees uh, because after such a, a cruel war, the communities uh, that have been affected will not uh, surrender their weapons if they don't have hard guarantees that they are not be, going to be ethnically, I mean, uh, politically cleansed or killed. Uh, and so there, I think uh, the fact that uh, Russia is uh, now very directly engaged 
uh, can be turned into something uh, quite positive as it can be part of the security guarantees that would be uh, required. Ambassador Farismond. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, sometimes when we listen to our Arab friends, we discover something is interesting for ourselves also. Uh, and we feel that Iran is uh, a new superpower. Iran is in Yemen, Iran in Bahrain, Iran is doing everything that wants in Syria, and Iran is supporting Maliki, and Iran is responsible for the situation in different Arab countries. Iran captured four Arab uh, capitals. Uh, don't forget that you are talking about a country who was under the toughest <laughs> sanction and embargo during the last uh, f uh, four decades. We did not have any uh, international ally. We did not have any uh, military agreement. We did not give any military basis to the Western powers. On the other hand, I think Iranian military budget cannot be compared with uh, some small countries in the region like Bahrain and Qatar. We spend more than 100 billions yearly on your military plans. My question is to Mr. Sadafi. Where you have been when Iran captured the three Arab capitals? Where you have been when Iran was doing everything if it wants in, in different Arab countries? Is this literature that we are uh, listening from you and we, when uh, we are hearing from you and the Arab media is repeating the same thing, where you have been when Iran under the sanction did what you are, you are accusing Iran? Is this literature is just for justifying your weakness and your unqualified policy in front of your people? Thank you. Answer. Well, where have By you been? Island. I think we've been dealing with the consequences of the trouble that you created, uh, whether in Lebanon or in Syria or in Iraq. That's where we've been. And you call it literature. Uh, again, let's look at the evidence. I mean, we, we call it facts. Uh, Iranian officials themselves, I mean, a senior Iranian uh, official three, four months ago, he came out on TV and he said, now we are in three Arab capitals. He was bragging about that. Uh, Ira you listen to Iranian leaders uh, in and out. Qasem Soleimani was in Syria, was in Iraq, again promoting all of that. And these are like videos and, 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 and facts that Iranian media uh, reports, not Arab media. Look, the Arab world has, would want, and I think I know Arab, Arab policy, all of them would want good relations with Iran. And you say we want to talk, and we say let's talk. But you know what the problem that you're doing, like even with, with Syria, you come and say, we want elections in Syria, but with no preconditions, which means Assad is not out. It's just like Netanyahu coming and saying, we want to solve the Arab-Israeli uh, 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 conflict, but no preconditions about talking about 1967 borders or withdrawing from the West Bank. So some, some, some state, uh, they're not preconditions, they're realities. The reality is the Arab world has embraced good relations with Iran. The reality is Iran has reciprocated by assuming a very expansionist, interventionist policy in places. I mean, do you deny that Iranian soldiers are fighting in Syria? Do you deny that Iran has been arming and financing Hezbollah? Do you deny that Iran has been meddling in affairs of Bahrain and Yemen? So that is my answer. So again, my answer, my friend, is that we'd love good, warm relationship with Iran because we are our neighbors. We hate to see the zero gun, but you know, I'm sorry, the pressure is on you and on us. Stop interfering in our affairs, everything will be great. We have time for one final question by Michael Mayer is ende. Thank you very much. I work for Democracy Reporting International, a Berlin based NGO, and I would like to pick you up uh, on the question of elections. You criticize very much the so-called Western democracy agenda in the Middle East. We heard the same from the Russian ambassador this morning. And yet when recently elections were ventured as an idea again from Damascus, Iran and uh, Russia have been very enthusiastically embracing that idea. And I wonder how these two elements square. And I would also <laughs> like to hear from you, how do you see elections would take place in Syria at the moment? What are the preconditions and what would they do to that country at this point in time? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Actually, I think Iran, Russia, and French, this is my own initiation. This is my own experience to working with the French government. 
I was in Russia a few months ago, and I was in uh, Syria two months ago. I know very well the, what is the situation. I believe if Iran, Russia, and French seated on the table can make a good initiation for make a solution in Syria. That would be possible. As my understanding, the French policy to the region and Russian policy to the region, we can find a new roadmap and very good uh, implementation plan to make a solution. I hope the next trip of President Rouhani to Paris would be started a very good situation for the region and for the people of the region. And I have one thing that would be most important. This is the a story of the region. My uh, Dr. Ayman emphasized of the Iranian position and Iranian authority. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Oman a few months ago told me we have a meeting with the John Kerry. All Arab in the Persian Gulf and some of them is out of the Persian Gulf. We have a meeting with John Kerry, the Minister of State. Uh, of the United States of America. He said, the beginning of the meeting, everybody criticized American policy toward Iran. Why Americans seated on the table and negotiating with Iran for nuclear cases? Why American foreign minister walking in Geneva with Minister Zarif? And why everything? The minister Kerry immediately criticized them. All of them here, you do not have any plan to confrontation at terrorism, and you do not have any one General Soleimani to demolishing a terrorism in the region. We are ready to demolishing a terrorism. We are ready to establish a peace continuity, stability in the region. We wanted to have a region as a very region, like a normal region, like a Singapore or some other place, Malaysia or some other places. Would be active in economic, would be have a very good relationship with each other. How? They must removing history and they must removing a very bad background from their mind. We dedicated our blood for our Muslims and brothers, Arabs and non-Arabs and Muslims in the region. Now, finally, look their positions. We are ready to make a solution. We are working to a new initiations, as, you to, as I told you. I hope Iran French, Russia would be a new initiation for future to make a solution for Syria. I believe that would be possible. Everything is possible and nothing is impossible in the region. That's a wonderful point to, to almost end on. Instead of a final round here on the panel, I would like to do a little exercise with you. So here's the exercise. Um, I would like you to complete the following sentence because we were supposed to talk about the future of the Middle East. We ended up talking a lot about the history of the Middle East, but anyways. Um, so the exercise goes like this. Please um, complete the sentence that goes, the future, or the Middle East in 2020 will be hmm, hmm, hmm. Oh and you God. do the hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> Phil, you're first, and very briefly. Well, are you kidding us? <laughs> trying to make you suffer. I, I can't help one very quick observation on, on this vigorous Arab uh, <laughs> discussion.
debate we just heard. No, seriously, it, it just reminds me so much, and a lot of us have been doing this for a long time, I'm conscious we're in Berlin, of the worst of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, where just this assumption that the other side is bound and determined to undermine your system, ideologically opposed, and as we all know and learned from that episode, the quest for absolute security leads to absolute insecurity. And I think this is, this is my answer to your question also, because if that continues, the Middle East in 2020 is going to be even worse than it is today. Uh, because so long as you have this determination where the Gulf Arab states are certain that Iran is on the march and taking over capital after capital, and they have to at all costs stop Iran and under, undermine the system, and Iran uh, carrying on and not recognizing their insecurities, I think if you've seen, well, one of the lessons I took out of the White House doing the Middle East for a couple of years is just when you think it can't get any worse, uh, it actually can. And so my answer to your question, Nora, is if we don't change some of the thinking that we heard as part of this discussion, the Middle East in 2020 is going to be even worse than it is today. Sadek Haradi, the Middle East in 2020. Actually, <laughs> uh, I am very optimistic, basically. I am very optimistic, not as a, my... Frank, uh, he's a pessimistic. I believe everything we can do for make a solution in the region. And uh, the people, our people living in the modern time, the time of informatic and the time of electronic, everybody knows each other. Everybody wanted to have a good lifestyle. Why? the region do not have a peace and do not have any good style of life. This is the wishes of the people of the region wanted to have a lifestyle. If welcoming to the democracy in the region, I believe this is my own understanding and my own studies from the region. If everybody, from inside and outside of the region. Supporting democracy, I believe we have a very comfortable situation in future, and we would be have a very, another Middle East to show to the people of the world. Thank you. Ayman, wow. briefly. Tell you got away this time, you know, because it got Iran, <laughs> Arab, and the U.S. was kept of, <laughs> of, of the debate. But, and, and it looks like the problems of the region are purely linked to regional sort of inter-rivalries. But there is, let's face it, the Middle East has always been a scene of, of global, uh, you know, uh, uh, politics. And, and accordingly, five years from now, what's going to happen, we could have, you know, more crises and we could have an opportunity. But to do that, we need to stop looking at things as a zero-sum game. In Syria, it, if we continue with a zero-sum game, it's not, it's not going to be solved. There has to be a compromise, but a compromise that embodies the basic principle of, of people being freed from oppression. With Iran, relations could and should improve because, after all, we share the same you know, region where nobody's going away. But that also would require major policy change within Iran to start accepting the international system as part of a Australian system of states where you have to respect that and not go above state politics. The U.S., the rest of the world, Russia, I think, uh, again, there are a lot of problems we did not discuss today, but they are at the core of it. The Palestinian-Israeli issue is a major issue that's going to hit every bus, everybody on the face if we Don't do something, go into it, no. <laughs> if we're going to do something like that. So I think the U.S. needs to, it cannot just not engage in the region after a lot of what we're dealing with now is the consequence of its engagement. So it has to be more engaged. Uh, Europe needs to play a major role and look beyond I think the refugee crisis at, at, at the roots and try to uh, play a, a sort of a supportive role in getting some of these uh, crises uh, uh, resolved. So again, the bottom line is that it cannot be a zero-sum game. There's got to be a compromise from every side to move on. Now, all my hopes rest on you, Jean-Marie Guéhenot, that this exercise, just complete the sentence with <laughs> half of a sentence, does work. Okay, well, I guess I have to speak as a kind of putative great-grandson of Mr. Pico there. <laughs> And I would say that the issue is not about getting the right borders from the Middle East. And I'm going to answer your question in a couple of sentences. Is that in, in 2020, I don't think the Middle East will have achieved a profound transformation that is just beginning. 
because what it is all about is really about the legitimacy of states. What are their foundations? Democracy is wonderful, but how do you, what are the polities around which, uh, what is the dimension that you emphasize? Is it religious, non-religious? What, all these issues are in the open. And I think that's going to be a generational change, uh, which will take not five years, but Absolutely. 25 years at a minimum. And uh, the, the challenge for diplomats is going to be, and for political leaders in the region, is in the midst of that transformation, which looks a bit like the transformation that uh, happened when the nation state emerged uh, in Europe, that those transformations are not as violent and costly in human lives as the transformation that led to I mean, the consolidation of nation states in Europe, that we don't have uh, I mean, Francois Bourg likes to talk about a 30 years war. And I think that's very much a possibility in that region. And so our task is not to create the ideal political shape for that. That will be done by the people of the region, but at least not to add fuel uh, to the fire uh, so that this transformation is as peaceful as possible. And it probably won't be completely peaceful. It is not at the moment. Uh, but it will take much more than five years. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, someone smart said that if you want a happy ending, that depends on where you stop your story. I'm afraid we didn't get a happy ending for the Middle East here, but we have to stop our story right now. So a big thank you to our panelists for what has been a very lively and interesting conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for actively listening and for your good and concise questions. Now we all deserve a strong cup of coffee and we'll come back. Um, to, for our debate about China and is China's growing military a threat to Asia. Thank you very much. <laughs>